is a panel about okay so that, that's the other announcement we are recording if you do not want your face on the recording turn your camera off now um so we're going to kick it off uh with some session with some presentations about food from uh we're gonna have one from jennifer brannick at the university of southern mississippi from another one from Christian Nitre and Christine Fina at Stony Brook University. And uh, finally, uh, from Dean DeBolt at the University of West Florida. And presenters, I'm gonna let you read off your titles and tell us more about you as necessary. Um, so I'm just gonna be quiet and take it away, Jennifer. Okay, let me... Get this up. Okay. Um, hey, I'm Jennifer Brannick. I'm the curator of rare books at Mississippiana at the University of Southern Mississippi. And um, today I'm going to talk a little bit about our cookbook collection and how I have used it in library instruction. Um, so we've been collecting cookbooks at USM for over 10 years. Um, our collection started small and only a, with only a handful of books. But over the years, we have amassed over 5,000 cookbooks with about 2,000 of them being from Mississippi community cookbooks. To build this collection, I've worked with USM culinary historian, Dr. Andrew P. Haley on reaching out to donors and giving presentations to community groups around the state about, uh, about this uh, cookbook collection. In addition, we hosted annual cookbook talks where Andrew would talk about a single cookbook with attendees preparing recipes from the cookbook for a potluck dinner. It can be difficult to promote cookbooks as real research tools. There's often the misconception that cookbooks are only valuable as a collection of recipes. That's why you'll often find them at estate sales, garage sales, and honestly, that's how we get most of the materials. Uh, the families just don't want the cookbooks and they don't see the value in them since all recipes are online, according to them. Um, what I try to show researchers is that the books are often the only resources available about many small communities. Sure, there are tons of cookbooks from Hattiesburg, but what about Silverina, Mississippi? The only resources we have about Silverina are two cookbooks and a telephone directory. The cookbooks often have local histories in the front of the volume, and with the community cookbooks, you'll find the names of the women who submitted the recipes. By using newspaper databases and genealogical sites, you can piece together the histories of the towns through the people listed in the cookbooks. In addition, the cookbooks speak to women's history in the state. Most of the materials in many of our collections uh, were created by white men about the stuff that white men were doing. These cookbooks were created by women and talk about their interests and lives and reflect their place in the communities. The only unfortunate aspect is that you have to hunt for the women's names because they were often listed under their husbands in the cookbooks. In recent years, I've integrated these cookbooks into library instruction. The easiest way to expose students to the materials is through classes that focus on culinary history which makes sense, right? <laughs> so I usually do a show and tell um, session where I have a variety of cookbooks um, um, laid out for the, for the students to look at. Um, whether these, um, um, this instruction is for Andrew's food course or a class often taught through the Honors College, I pull a myriad of items that reflect the diverse types of cookbooks we have and the kinds of information that can be gleaned from the sources. And working with professors, we often uh, team teach about food history through the cookbooks or touch on if there's more specific things that the professors want and the classes focus on, then I touch on that as well. Cookbooks are great to use in classes because they could, you can pull them out from many different disciplines. First year English classes regularly visit to learn more about the different research opportunities and special collections. For these classes, I use a speed dating exercise where I set up six tables with an item on each table and a list of questions for the students to answer as a group. After seven to nine minutes, depending on the size of the class, the students move to the next table and answer questions about that item. Over the course of the class, students will date each item and analyze the ways in which you can use it in research. When selecting items for speed dating, especially for English 102 classes, I try to select materials that are interesting by illustrating different ways to look at the materials. Um, here's the cookbook I use for speed dating. Uh, Super Mother's Cooking with Grass is a cookbook um, out of California uh, that was donated to us from a donor on the Mississippi coast who scoured garage sales for cookbooks um, and that he'd then donate to us. Surveying one of the donations, I saw this cookbook and thought, you know, this is kind of different than what we normally see. Um, I started looking through and noticing the, all the Southern recipes and only later did I realize that every recipe had marijuana as an ingredient. 
So here we have a marijuana cookbook from a head shop in California featuring Southern recipes and owned by someone in Mississippi. Um, and I did look up the head shop, the people who manufactured it, the Sunshine Manufacturing Import Company, and uh, their warehouse burned up. I found a new story. Their warehouse burned up in the mid 70s. And the article said you could smell patchouli in the air for weeks to come. <laughs> so that's kind of what happened with um, that place. What makes this item um, so successful for speed dating is that the booklet is very short. It's only 15 pages. And most students nowadays don't really don't equate the word grass with marijuana. So it takes most groups a while to figure out the correlation. And even some groups never figure it out. The discussions always start with, do you just go out and get the grass in your front yard? Um, there are often hints, this, there are some hints in the book that students can use to figure out the special ingredient. Um, but the list, like the list of other books on the back, um, on the back cover, or the fact that grass was often measured by lid, uh, lids in the recipe. And um, I had to look this up. I did not know what a lid was. But for those of you who may be curious, uh, marijuana was, was measured in mayonnaise lids. So you can get a mayonnaise lid of, of marijuana. Um, but by having these unknowns, it gives students things to figure out. And I think that's key to making these, uh, this a successful exercise. Most groups do notice that some of the recipes in the cookbook are for Southern foods. Um, for the students to look over this book and come away with questions is what I'm kind of hoping for. Why were the recipes Southern? Did someone associated with this group come from the South? What was Southern food common around the country? And, you know, a story I tell is often about uh, this letter from the Theodore Bilbo Collection, who was a controversial senator, for, U.S. senator from Mississippi, um, about how he uh, completed a poll for the National Restaurant Association. And in it, he must have complained about how you couldn't find gumbo on menus. And so this is 1941. And so the response from the National Restaurant Association was perhaps the reason why restaurants haven't learned how to cook this dish is because the restaurant isn't generally available. At least we haven't been able to find it um, in any one of the number of very good cookbooks. Um, and so this kind of is another question that you can kind of ask about, you know, the, the marijuana cookbook, because, you know, was Southern food um, something you're going to find, you know, around the country? And probably by 1971 more so. But as you can see here in 1941, that wasn't the case. The next ex exercise that I use often was one that someone posted about on the Food Collections Google group. Um, and if you don't know about that, I'll, I'll put it in the chat later, um, but it's a uh, group of, uh, it's like kind of a listserv of people who have food collections, I'm over into food collections. Um, so I took um, this exercise I'm going to show you and adapted it to the classes at USM. For this exercise, I call reading early cookbooks. I divide the class into groups and have them blindly select a vintage recipe from a set that I've compiled. The students are tasked with taking that recipe and translating it to a modern audience. For the first eight to 10 minutes, the students aren't allowed to use their cell phones and must work as a group to translate the recipe. If I, don't do, if I didn't do this, the students would spend less time with the recipes and get sucked into the temptations to use their phones. They are prompted to identify words that are unfamiliar and notice any elements that are missing, like a cooking temperature or directions on how to cook something, like rum, as you can see in this recipe. So it's a recipe for rum cake that doesn't include rum. Um, so some of the things we were talking about as a class is, you know, was this uh, temperance, you, you know, temperance movement thing? Was it that you're supposed to add the rum later? Is it just assumed that you know to add rum? Um, so those are some things that came out of this recipe. And also there are no temperatures because <laughs> you're cooking by wood, right? By a wood fire. Um, they can also start reworking the recipe into the modern format. Then after 10 minutes, they can use their phones to look up unknown ingredients, or just in this case, how to roast a goose, which the students always get frustrated with because it says to do it in the same manner as ducks. But again, that was something that was probably, you know, common knowledge at this time. Um, I think that many of us are just trying to mark things off our list, to move on to the next, uh, next one. With this exercise, students are forced to slow down and really pay attention to the short text. Last week, I used this exercise in conjunction with a seminar on our American Civil War materials. The techniques used to analyze and to transcribe the recipes are very similar to what you would do with Civil War letters. You read the letter, maybe identify places, phrases, concepts that aren't familiar, and in some cases, translate and rewrite the letter. Some resources found in special collections are more challenging to use in, in classes, but through experimentation and professors who welcome creative approaches, cookbooks can be an integral part of the research and archival education process. Thank you.
okay? All right, I think we're okay. good. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Kristen Nitre, and I'm Director of Special Collections and University Archives and University Archivist at Stony Brook University. And hello, I am Christine Fina, Undergraduate Success Librarian, also from Stony Brook University. So in our presentation today, we will discuss our collaboration in designing an interactive virtual workshop using a historical Chinese cookbook collection, a special collection at Stony Brook University Libraries. We'll provide an overview of our workshop covering everything from the design process to the lessons that we've learned. So for some quick institutional context, Stony Brook University is located on Long Island, New York, and is the flagship public university in the state. With nearly 26,000 students, it offers over 200 undergraduate programs and more than 140 graduate and professional programs. Additionally, SBU Libraries is the largest research library on Long Island. Deeply integrated in the curriculum and workplace environment are activities that support a culture of diversity, equity, and inclusion. One initiative that embodies this DEI commitment is One Book, One Community, or, or OBOC, a campus and community common read. In 2021, in the midst of the global coronavirus pandemic, the target audience for this program was expanded to include the external community. In July 2021, Christine contacted me about participating in the OBOC calendar of events for that fall. The planning committee was seeking programming in support of the chosen book, Charles Yu's Interior Chinatown, a New York Times bestseller and the 2020 National Book Award winner. Yu's novel makes references to Chinese food stereotypes and uses a Chinese restaurant as a setting and backdrop for his larger story. For this common read, the, the university would provide free copies of the book and sponsor a series of in-person and virtual events. Pictured on the left is the homepage for the OBOC initiative, and on the right is the cover of the book that was branded specifically for Stony Brook University. On the top left of the cover is the SBU logo. So at the University Libraries, among the collections that I manage is the Jacqueline M. Newman Chinese Cookbook Collection, a special collection with relevance to use book. It is considered to be the largest of its kind in the world, comprising more than 5,000 rare and unique volumes published between the late 1800s and 2019, along with magazines, slides, and audiovisual materials. Its focus on Chinese cuisine provides a valuable record of the Chinese diaspora, which has spread its rich culinary traditions to every corner of the globe. Shown here are the covers of two rare books from the collection, Sarah Boss and Onada Wontana's Chinese Japanese Cookbook, published in 1914, and Eloise Edwards Digart's A Chinese Banquet, published in 1928. And pictured here are the covers of four books that show the diversity of the collection. Beginning in the early 1900s, Chinese cookbooks were being produced with an American audience in mind, and recipes were tailored to the American palate. A growing body of literature has discussed the research values of cookbooks as historical primary sources. More than recipes, cookbooks provide valuable evidence and insights that contribute to the study of social histories, cultural norms, and economic conditions during the periods in which they were created. I do conduct in-person instruction sessions using this collection. These sessions are designed with learning objectives based on established frameworks, such as guidelines for primary source literacy. Specifically, I emphasize um, objectives outlined in sections 3b, which is read, understand, and summarize, and 4b, interpret, analyze, and evaluate from the guidelines. The structure of a session typically includes five segments. I begin with an introduction to special collections. This is followed by an overview of the Newman Collection and Chinese culinary history. I then demonstrate and give instructions on handling rare books. Um, for the activity, students then examine a book and answer guided questions uh, using a handout, and we conclude with an open discussion about discoveries and insights gained from the exercise. For the OBOC initiative, Christine and I adapted and transformed elements of the session into an online experience. We also reimagined the in-person examination of materials as an interactive group activity. 
whoops, here I am, I'm just changing, there we go. Yeah, so we called the event More Than Recipes, A Taste of the Jacqueline M. Newman Chinese Cookbook Collection. We promoted it through the library's established promotional workflow, and we also had the event listed on the OBOC website, so we were able to recruit to the larger community. We also promoted especially to first-year students, and based on our analysis of 137 Zoom attendees and responses to our feedback form, it is clear the majority of participants were first-year students. So this became a wonderful way to show off a special collection and also connect with new students in their first semester at SBU. This is just an outline. It was an hour. Um, you can see I started by welcoming everyone, contextualizing the program and the OBOC initiative, and then Kristen did the bulk of presenting on the collection, and we both led the activity followed by a Q&A. And what we want to talk to you about is a little bit more about the activity design. So we um, made it so participants could explore five books from the collection. They considered primary source elements and then posted their ideas, reactions, and or analysis to a Padlet, uh, which for those of you who don't know, it's a visual tool to support the sharing of content and ideas online. We couldn't pass around the books for participants to physically examine, so we put in the chat a link to Kristen's beautiful slideshow she made featuring scans of each book. They were shared in visually consistent ways, with each book getting two slides, and the participants had time to look through it, select at least one book they wanted to examine more closely, and then analyze their chosen book by considering physical characteristics, author, place of publication, historical or social contexts, content such as ingredients or titles of recipes, and any meanings that they are taking with them. So here are two slides, just as an example of one of the books. The first slide always included a, a scan of the book cover on the right, and we had introductory pages on the left, while the second slide always included a smaller version of the cover at the top right, and at least one recipe uh, was on the second slide. Both slides included a reminder of the analytical elements to consider, and you can see for this book, participants could analyze the cover, the title page, a photograph of the author, uh, a recipe, and a paragraph about methods for Chinese cooking. So after giving participants some time to examine those slides, we put in the chat a link to the Padlet. We designed the Padlet so that each book had its own column and we use the book covers to connect each column to the slides they use to learn about the books. We also provided an example post uh, so participants would have a sense of what to do. And at this point, we just held our breaths <laughs> and hoped that people would actually post <laughs> to the Padlet. Um, it was exciting then when the post started to come in and in all, we had 29 participants contribute 31 posts. They posted on topics related to gender roles, use of different languages, representation of Chinese culture and identity, approach to nutrition and historical context. One post, for example, noted that one recipe included, quote, prices labeled for each ingredient, unquote, and they made a connection from that to the time period of the Great Depression in which the book was published. Overall, it was really rewarding to read and discuss the participants' many observations and analytical points. And if we have time during the Q&A, we'd be happy to show the full Padlet in uh, more detail. So 16% of the attendees completed the feedback survey. Uh, participants said they enjoyed both learning about the history behind the cookbooks and the interactive group discussion. Comments included, quote, I liked learning about the evolution of Chinese culture within American society, unquote. And quote, this event was really cool. And I learned about different cooking books and how Chinese food changes and why the Americanized version is so different, unquote. Responses also showed an increase in awareness of special collections with one respondent answering that they enjoyed learning about, quote, your amazing cookbook collection. So here are some things that we thought went really well. 
Uh, first, we did assume we would have a very broad and diverse audience, so we provided plenty of context. We also used a lot of instructional scaffolds to support an optimal learning environment. Kristen chose really focused content to feature on the slides, and we only gave them two slides per book to avoid information overload. Uh, and the virtual modality ended up giving us access to a much larger audience than we could have reached if it were an in-person workshop. Uh, we also really enjoyed the collaborative aspect of the event, both by working with the OBOC folks and the opportunity to get to work with each other uh, since we're in different divisions in the library. And finally, having both of us plan together and run the Zoom meeting was beneficial, both from a content and facilitation perspective. So in the future, one thing we realized was that we could have actually held up each book physically in front of the camera rather than relying exclusively on the slideshow images. That may have given the attendees a better sense of dimension and fragility of each item. We also think we could have promoted directly to relevant courses, faculty, and students. Uh, and finally, we think this event framework could be repurposed for other collections or audiences, and we would very much like to do it again. Uh, this is our citation for a published case study about this event and also our contact information. We'd be happy to hear from you or answer any questions. That is it. Right, Dean, you're up next. Yeah, just a second. I'm trying to get my uh, file to come up here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, can everybody see that? Yes. Okay. So I'm at the University of West Florida in Pensacola, Florida. And our university, when we started in 1967, very recently, uh, we were the uh, first university on the 400-mile stretch of the Gulf Coast between New Orleans and Tallahassee. And our first president said that our purpose of our university was not the University of West Florida, but the University for West Florida. And if that philosophy took hold, what we decided to do in the library was to cover in our collection the history, the people, and the development of the West Florida region, primarily the Spanish and British colonies before 1780, before 1821. And then after 21, we covered the 10 county panhandle of Florida. And we co collect all kinds of materials like most archive, books, photographs, manuscripts, family papers, business records. We, uh, we have about two, we have two buildings, we have nearly two million items on the staff. And I, one of the, the things that comes up every so often is when I mention to people that we collect cookbooks, why most librarians kind of get this look on their face, uh, a cookbook, because if you go to a library book sale, that's one of the first things you see at book sale, it's just tables covered with thousands of cookbooks that people have donated to their library and library intended to not want them. So one of the things I've had to have go across is, is why why we collect cookbooks and why we are trying to to do that. So we get cookbooks many different ways. We find them in gifts and in donation. I'll solicit them. I'll find out somebody who published one and ask for one. Um, usually at a last resort, we will, we will purchase one depending on what they are. Now the catch here, because of our 10 county region, this is our focus. And so therefore we don't have to collect Minnesota or Long Island or, or those things we collect in our area. So the question is, what about cookbooks? Well, we don't collect the, uh, we don't collect general cookbooks. We, we collect ones in our area, but there are, we get, do get ones occasionally. And I like them because they have a backstory. This is one of my favorites. It's called Mrs. Orr's New Cookbook. It was published in 1902. 1903, and it has recipes in it. And this is the first cookbook 
where Mr. Zor talked about taking cuts of grinding meat and grinding them in a grinder and creating the ground beef that you could put into little, mold into little steaks and you could cook them and she called them Hamburg steaks. And the story goes that at the 1904 World Fair, the vendors would put these between pieces of bread and they would call them hamburgers, for example. Well, this is an example of a cookbook that I can use and I can tell what a, what a backstory is, why a cookbook is important. I've always also heard that that's not really a true story, that the hamburgers were around other ways, but this, this is one of the popular stories. One of the catches we have in, in terms of working with, with cookbooks, especially in our region, regional cookbook, is that our cataloging people from the university first started did not want to catalog cookbooks. They were they were all kinds of formats and sizes and all. And so we had to set up our own system of keeping track of printed material from our area. And so we began a project called the Bibliography of West Florida, which we annotate any kind of material that's published in our region we describe the item and then we describe what it is and it becomes a finding aid when people come in and they say i want to see cookbooks from your area or this region we can use this internal tool that we have we can we can use it to find different kinds of things now we can use cookbooks in many different ways and one of them we can use is is to correspond is to tie in with other things in our collection so this is a glass plate negative from a collection that we have and it's the fancy Christmas dinner at the Brent family home, which was a, a big uh, a big mansion in our North Hill district of Florida. And there they are all waiting for dinner to be served. And so we can take things like that and we can then talk about people about food ways. What kind of food might they have been serving? What would they have access to? One of our earliest cookbooks is this one is the Gulf City Cookbook, published in Mobile, Alabama in 1882. And uh, the recipes are, are rather general. They they like uh, like the, like uh, Jennifer was saying they they don't uh, they don't cover uh, they don't they don't give uh, percentages or times of cooking or, or other kinds of thing. But this is our region, and so we have that as one of our earliest cookbooks. Most of the cookbooks that we get are, are from churches. And so they may range in various different ways. This is a undated cookbook that is um, mimeograph, made up of mimeograph sheet put together by the Pine Forest United Methodist Church here in Pensacola. Um, and uh, I like the recipe on the page, the icebox fruit cake and the midnight magic cake, which um, after reading the recipe, I didn't find it much, much to be midnight or magic, but it's a neat, neat title for a recipe. A lot of churches will produce booklets. These are spiral bound booklets, plastic bound booklets, uh, such as this one. It also is undated, but if you look in the middle of the page to the right, they've got something called the psychedelic salad. And usually the word psychedelic is now used until the late 1960s and early 70s during the culture revolution. And, and so that helps us to date something like this. Another thing that churches will use and do is there are a number of organizations that will publish cookbooks for churches. That is, they handle all the aspects of the publishing, the arranging it, the typesetting, all that kind of stuff. The churches merely have to get the recipes together and, and all, and then they're, they're published by the publisher. And it's a, it's a way churches will form that cooperation, collaboration, and, and sell cookbooks on the side. And so this is a 2001, again, a national cookbook. This is from the First Baptist Church, Pensacola, and it's got a recipe in it by my members and their and their name. We have their name. This one from Defuniac Spring, Florida, which is about a hundred miles to our east of Pensacola, and um, it is the First Methodist Church there. And I have it open to this page. I have I was just flipping through it, and I opened it for this page. And if you look on the right, the recipe called Anna's Cucumber Aspic is by a man named Sonny Hollingsworth. Well, I happen to know Sonny Hollingsworth. Unfortunately, he passed away last year. But his mother was a newspaper reporter and a writer for the Defuniac Herald newspaper. And we have her papers here, all the things that she wrote over the year and research she did on historic homes and all that. And his recipe called Anna's Cucumber Aspic, Anna being Anna Reardon, his, his mother. So our, our book will tell something about families and people in our area. But a lot of problems I have with cookbooks is people think we're either interested in all the popular ones that come out, Rachel Ray and all the others, 
or they think of church cookbooks and they can't think of anything more boring than than uh, than church church cookbooks. But I want to give you some examples of why I think they're important. This one was published by the Pensacola Historic Preservation Society in 1974 as a fundraiser, and it's been, it been republished. They've gone through a number of printings still being sold. But it has historical recipes and has information about several a different aspects of Pensacola, historical aspects, and the different houses and architecture. And some of the recipes, I happen to know the two people that put this book together, they were both in their, their mid-80s when I came to Pensacola. And I knew both of them as historians, historian, but they would never cite their sources, and they're not cited in this book either. But a lot of the early recipes are used here, are, are copied, and they're used locally by some of the reenactment groups and historical site interpreters and so forth. This is a 1934 book that was put together locally between the Piggly Wiggly grocery store chain and WCOA, which is our radio, was our radio station that started broadcasting in 1926. And I think it's really a really cool uh, little book. Um, and it does have recipe even actually the name on the page of, um, uh, I, I know some of the families here and some of the people. And so these are, these are local individuals. The North Hill Preservation Association put together a cookbook in 1972. This is a part of Pensacola, the historic district made up of houses. And what they did with their cookbook was not only did they put recipes from the people in the area that North Hill area, but they also put in pictures or drawings of the houses along with information about the houses as of as of the time of the publication, um, 1982. And so it gives us a kind of a, a, a bookmark of historic preservation uh, tied in with with cookbooks. And I think that that's really helpful when we're doing historical research, historic house research as well. This is a cookbook that put together by a special class of the local school district, old hometown class. And this little cookbook is about six inches by six and a half inches. And the students went around and they collected recipes, not only from people, but also from a number of important restaurants in town. And many of these are no longer in existence, at being this being almost 20 years ago. Um, and the neat thing about the cookbooks is they have cartoon, little cartoons in it, which I enjoy. But they also listed the con students and they gave students credit for their work in, in producing the cookbook. This is another kind of similar cookbook that was published in 1995. It's a hardback book. Um, there's a highway, a state highway, that goes along the coast here in West Florida between Destin, Florida, and Panama City. This is a very wealthy uh, community. There's a lot of movie stars that have home, from her home here and so forth. And there are some really fancy restaurants here. And this cookbook was put together as a marketing tool but it covers re restaurants in the area at the time, usually with a picture of the restaurant and then a story of it. And we've lost a number of these due to Hurricane Katrina and Michael and others, but the restaurants are here and then along with some of their, some of their recipe. And I think that is just really helpful in showing that cookbook can be more than just the recipe or the food ways or identifying people in the region, but also um, history of the community itself. The Junior League public has this book published as a marketing uh, tool, and it still I still see it for sale sometimes in the airport. And none of the recipes are identified as to the donors, so it's more of a traditional kind of cookbook. So we don't have a lot of traditional cookbooks in the collection. And one final one I'll mention is we had a a chef or a food 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 service instructor. <clears throat> Earl Payroll at Pensacola Junior College and the local PBS TV station asked him to start doing a live cooking show in 1977. And that took off and he produced a cookbook of his recipe and then a second one. And then PBS picked it up, picked up his show and started showing rebroadcasting it nationally, which brought more marketing and more sales of his cookbook, which went through like six volumes and also another gourmet cooking. Now, another way we can try the cookbooks into our regular collection, if we have things like this, this is the logbook of Her Majesty Ship the Mentor, 
a British uh, warship, which is here in Pensacola Harbor in 1780. It was here when the Spanish attacked Pensacola in 1781 and captured it. And the ship was scuttled, and the captain took this logbook back to England with him. <clears throat> and his wife, uh, because they have blank pages in the back, his wife flipped it over and turned it into a household account book, where she started keeping track of of food and purchases and sales of sheep and other kinds of things. And so we can tie the cookbooks to history of the area, to restaurants, to businesses, to other kinds of food ways into the collections. And so that's why the cookbooks are so important to us. Although I do find librarians that will still roll their eyes when they think of cookbook, because they think of all the gift cookbook they get for the, uh, for the book sales. And so thank you for let me share that collection with you and uh, more happy, happy to take any questions after I finish this. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. Um, if you have questions you want to ask, you can unmute yourself or you can put questions in the chat and they'll be glad to answer them for you. I can get us started. I have a question for Jennifer, which is, um, this is just idle curiosity on my part, uh, but what's the what's the oldest cookbook that y'all have? The oldest Mississippi cookbook, I think, is like 1908, uh, Mississippi Community Cookbook. Um, and the oldest cookbook we have is maybe 1840s. Maybe something like that. Yeah. We we have a cookbook collection too, but I mean, I'm mostly collecting North Mississippi. Uh, but I was also going to say, you should tell them about the database you all are working on, the, the cookbook database. Well, we do have, uh, we have been working on digitizing and making available our uh, community cookbooks online. So in our digital collections, we have probably over 100 community Mississippi community cookbooks digi fully digitized and online so we send those out to you know different people to access them and we've had plenty of tons we've had several people over the years say that this you know they remember these cookbooks from when their mother had them and mm -hmm. and like family recipes that were lost were able to be found because we were we put these online and uh, we do abide by copyright um, you know most of the ones we put in are prior to 1970 so if they didn't renew copyright which many places many of these local cookbooks did not, and we make them available. Someone in the chat asked, have you done or will you do an exhibition of the cookbooks? I guess that's open to any of you guys. I've done smaller exhibitions, so. Well, we have exhibit cases. Well, I'll put cookbooks or something up there, show some of the, on the culinary thing. My mother did something when I was growing up and her local Methodist church would have a cook cookbook thing. And she made, she'd make up her own recipes. And what she did, she wanted to, I guess, immortalize me and my father. So she would make, submit recipes under each of our names. And so <laughs> it's a cookbook. There's a cookbook in my hometown that have my name in it, although I never made a recipe in my life. Um, and my dad really didn't make a recipe, but my mother felt it important to keep our names in the, so I don't know if other I don't know if other people did that in their in their cookbooks as well. They're off on other side. There are will be manuscript cookbooks. I didn't go spend a lot of time in that, but we do have collection where people we we have found folders where people have handwritten recipes that they have that they have done and they have made. We mostly get more interested in in recipes that come from like famous restaurants. Uh, there's one in Florida called the Columbia House. They have a restaurant in Tampa, St. Augustine, and Miami, I think. Uh, they made a very famous salad called the 1905 salad, and people always are asking for that, and they finally published a book with that recipe, and people are always buying that cookbook and taking it home to duplicate that. So we see that locally. People we remember restaurants that they grew up in that no longer exist, and they had this fancy thing, and these will show up in some of the recipe. Something else I would like to say is that, um, you know, over over the past couple of years, I've been in talks with people around here about do, applying for a large grant to do a Southern Foodways mm. grant, 
where we put stuff about make it available online and um maybe do programming i mean you know i've tossed around a bunch of ideas <laughs> but you know it's just me so i'm trying to, you know i haven't put it out yet but um you know if anybody's interested let me know we can start talking Um, from the chat, this question is for anyone. Do you know of anyone that has tried to make any of the historical recipes? I'm really interested to know whether they'd still turn out well. For example, ingredients like baking soda are made differently now than they used to be. And I will say, I know that I've followed some people on TikTok that do this, and it is fun to watch them make like old recipes and like all the jello and all that. <laughs> so, has have, anyone experienced that? I, I have a recipe that, that, that turned up from the early from the 17th century and I call it pilgrim bread it's actually just making bread in at the same technique that would have been around in the 1620s 1670s and so I have a thanksgiving talk that I give to organizations um and I'll make the I make the, the pilgrim bread and the I call it pilgrim bread but I made the bread the same way it's a brown bread it takes three kinds of flowers, and I've had trouble getting getting the three kinds of flour. But I have to go around to the international food store and some of the things just to get some of the. Uh, you got to have a, a, a fine cornmeal flour. You got to have a rye flour. You got to have a little bit of white flour. You, I don't know. There's like three or four flours to to try to get the coarseness and the roughness of a 17th century a bread kind of thing. And also uh, the way I I I it, it comes out pretty good. It's a good it, it, it's crusty and it, it doesn't it doesn't um, it doesn't have the attractiveness of a loaf of sunbeam bread in the grocery store. Okay, and so uh, people laugh when they see it, and I say, hey, this is what our ancestors. You know, this is you know the only thing that it doesn't charred. Okay, I don't charred. I don't put it in the ashes of the fire and burn it. But uh, I could I could if I could do that. But I've tried a few of them. I think that's one of the problems with the older recipes is finding the ingredients that are perhaps not as pure as they would have been. Um, my mother, my dad, my mother had an old story. I'll share it real quickly. And she said, she, she, my dad would talk about these cookies that his grandmother made. And and he and whether my mother would make cookies, my, my dad would always say something, oh, but these are good, but you know, my grandmother made the best cookie. And she finally got the recipe. She finally worked for the family and got the recipe and she made them and he tasted them. He said, Well, these are okay, but they just they just don't taste the same way grand grandma made them. And my mother my mother came up with two excuses. Number one, if the ingredients weren't the same, you're cooking them on a flat cast iron stove, so you're not, it's not the perfect temperature of our 350 degree oven or whatever. That was one recipe. But then the other catch was memory and love. And so nothing could equal that. That was a hidden recipe that couldn't could change the context of the recipe. And she realized after a while she could never duplicate that. We we did some programming up here where we were cooking. The librarians were cooking the historic recipes for the students. So uh, so yes, I have tried to make some of these historic things, and um, the reactions varied from kind of muffled terror to uh, to outright. Uh, Please, can we not ever do this again? <laughs> um, so, <laughs> but, but but sometimes they would. Uh, they would happily eat them. Uh, I I made uh, and this um, this is not really Mississippi delicacy. It probably is a Southern delicacy, but I made Coke salad, mm. uh, which mm. is it involves Coca Cola and gelatin and uh, black cherries. Mm -hmm. and it's actually delicious yeah. with uh, with whipped cream. Um, but I did get a I did get a just like Mommy used to make uh, on that one. Mm. So that was the the highlight. Mm of that particular practice. It's pretty, pretty timely because we um, actually got an email earlier today. Um, every summer at the Mississippi Department of Archives and History, we have tomato sandwich day, which is a mm. it's essentially just a potluck. Uh, but this year we are doing a pie making contest and it's for a specific pie, a chocolate pie that's from a great depression cookbook. And so I'm interested to see how that turns out. I'll have to follow up with you guys, but I don't think I'm going to attempt it because anything with meringue is not my friend, but I wish the best of luck to anyone who does attempt it. <laughs> 
And we, you know, we used to have a, for eight years, we had an annual potluck that would go with Dr. Haley's cookbook talk. And so the recipes were hit or miss, but we had community members who would come and prepare recipes as well. And one woman made a recipe from a cookbook and uh, she said, oh, I just wanted to let you all know that mama submitted the wrong recipe because she didn't want anybody to have her recipe. So she oh. made the real recipe. So that, that makes you wonder almost if half the rest, because no one really wants to give their recipe. Um, <laughs> so that's some things to, to keep in mind as well. Yes. Um, I'm curious, uh, Kristen and Christine, did any of your students try to make any of the dishes in those Chinese cookbooks? Not, no, not that we know of, unless they took the slides home and tried on their own and didn't tell us. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was virtual and, it, you know, it was a really huge meeting. And so we were sharing, it was, it was mostly just sort of the excitement of getting to explore this collection. Um, we do have a very large Asian American population at Stony Brook. And I, I shared the, the, the Padlet in the chat um, in response to Jennifer's question way up. Maybe I'll put the link in the chat again, but you can see some of their responses they were relating to some of the things in there as well. And they they saw um, someone commented on what they know is the mystic knot. Um, and so that was interesting that they were relating to it in all kinds of different ways. Kristen, you have anything you want to add? I'm not familiar with if any student has prepared, but I'll just to answer a previous question about exhibitions. I did a a huge exhibition. We have a, a Asian American, a Charles B. Wong Asian and American Asian and Asian American Center here, um, and so I did an exhibition of about two hundred cookbooks um, in that venue. And a few years ago, um, we had an exhibition, and the theme was um, the history of the potato. And so a lot of the cookbooks <laughs> were used. Uh, it was potatoism in the East. And so it was a really incredible um, way to, you know, feature a, a specific um, ingredient. Um, but we, for years, would have an annual event um, open to, and then we would follow a uh, after the lecture, have a big Chinese buffet that was for free. So it was very popular with students, of course. Um, it's gotten a little expensive to do that. But we're fortunate that our donor, uh, doc, Dr. Newman, has helped to establish an endowment so we can continue to maintain the collection. All of our books are cataloged. They're available through World, you know, OCLC, OCLC WorldCat. They can be discovered through our catalog. So, um, and we get a lot of reference requests about the collection from our university community, but also external scholars studying history of, um, you know, women and gender, gender to specific ingredients like the history of soy, for example. But some of these cookbooks, like we mentioned, they were tailored to the American palate. So they definitely, you know, the cooking, the ingredients include spam, frankfurters, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> just thing, <laughs> or spaghetti sauce, um, really interesting ingredients in some of these cookbooks. I, I probably should plead a mea culpa, and that is, after electronic cataloging came along and we had more access to greater things, our cataloging technical people, service people are very happy now to catalog cookbooks when I get them to them. But uh, but years ago, we went through a long period where, where they didn't want to do original cataloging. Okay? They just hated original cataloging. When, you know, there are catalogers that accept it like this is a puzzle and I'm going to solve this. And there's other people that go, oh, no, no, let someone else do it first and we'll copy, we'll copy do the copy cataloging. But we do we do have our uh, have them copy cataloging now. The, the, the nice thing about our annotation tool that we use is that one, for example, the cookbook I showed that had houses in it. We can put those. We can put let those list those in the annotation where normally the cataloging people are not going to are not going to go to that level in their in their cataloging entry. Um, the houses things are interesting because the, the houses in that book it was the house that name that it was known by could be the builder of the first family hyphen whoever had it in 1982 at the time the cookbook pat was was done. Okay, now it's not called that. they will called something else. Um, that's one problem I have with historical house research is people will rename them and change the name and call them different time periods. So anyway, but the cookbooks help us a little on that. Thank you. Any other questions or comments? I have another one. <laughs> so I'm just, I'm just full of questions today. Uh, 
<laughs> are are any of you uh collecting uh like promotional cookbooks for uh like put out by food companies? Like I have I have been been I guess somewhat sparingly adding uh adding single focus cookbook. Like we we have one for uh for rice, which is uh I think was produced by somewhere in Louisiana because rice is a big crop. Uh, down, you know, in the Mississippi, it was, you know, where, where we, where the Mississippi and Louisiana sort of intersect, it was big rice uh, industry. Um, and uh, sort of the infamous ketchup cookbook, which our catalogers actually practically went on strike after I made them uh, catalog mm -hmm. that because of the terrible photographs. Um, there's just, there's a lot of <laughs> ketchup. Uh, and, uh, and there was, and I have another one, actually, we might have two now for Crisco. Uh, one, one older, I think from the maybe late twenties, early thirties, when Crisco was still relatively new. And then another one from the seventies and they're all, you know, they're all very Crisco, <laughs> Crisco focused, uh, uses you never would have thought of for Crisco. Uh, so I'm just wondering, anyway, and also, um, so I guess, Emerging, I guess, emerging technology cookbooks is how I would call it. Like, how to how to cook with your pressure cooker, kind kind of thing. Uh, as as that as those different cooking and how to cook with your microwave, um, as those different cooking technologies emerged. Well, we we will we will collect we will collect these local little cookbooks that are produced by a company in our area, like. Gulf Power, Gulf Power officers were here. They're now they were bored by Florida Power and Light, but you know, Hygia Coca Cola Publishing Company, uh, co company that had a little booklet. Yeah, we will collect them if they're if they're merchants or businesses in our collecting region, our Panhandle region of Florida. But otherwise, no, I'm not. Uh, I, I'm not going out outside of that without limitation. I, I will collect them. I started, when we first started collecting, I was just like, sure, we'll take it all, you know, and I was just taking a lot at the beginning. Um, so we do have, we do have a, go, a good bit of different like baking soda ones from like the 1910s. But like, um, like Dean said, you know, I try to limit it, even if it's a national one that just has a stamp on the front from like Macomb, Mississippi, you know, even though it's not a Mississippi cookbook per se, that's what I kind of gravitate towards now. But I do have some microwave cookbooks and um, pressure cookers and new stove, electric stoves, like a lot of the, you know, um, the um, state agencies would do all the micro the cooking with um, gas type of thing or cooking with electric publication. I mean, we had over the years, I think, an extension publications. You can see uh, they're talking about, you know, how to make a nutritious meal with this <laughs> new technology or whatever. Um, and also, I mean, also some of these cookbooks are just tremendously entertaining, and I'm a sucker for a tremendously entertaining cookbook. <laughs> it's the main problem, but okay. Yeah. So, yeah, our collection at Stony Brook is a gifted collection from one donor, so we're not adding to our collection, but it does have, for example, um, going back to the early 1900s, these small um, pamphlet type cookbooks that were produced by La Choy, which is still a company in existence, which a lot of people don't realize it was founded in 1922 in Detroit. Um, it's not a Chinese company. Um, and then, like you said, oils like Mazzola would put out. Um, and also, you know, other companies such as like Betty Crocker put out Chinese cookbooks. So there's a lot of you know, diversity within the the spectrum of, of the Chinese um, cookbooks and also it's food technology, you know, how to cook um, Chinese food with microwave, um, how to cook, we have a book, how to cook Chinese food without Chinese ingredients. So <laughs> it's like we have over 5,000 titles. So um, if anyone's interested, please contact me. Um, uh, we're always happy to answer any questions about our collection here at Stony Brook. Wonderful. Um, well, if there are no more questions, um, you guys make sure that you check out all the wonderful resources that have been put in the chat with some great links on here. Um, we'll go ahead and take a little bit of a break, about 15 minutes, um, and come back here for the next session. So thank you guys so much. We're going to take a quick stretch, get a snack. We've been talking about food for the last hour. <laughs> <laughs>